All right, I think we'll get rolling here. Welcome everybody. Uh, this is the webinar about contracting with uh, weatherization service providers. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, we are going to probably do some overviews and presentations for about a half an hour, and then leave the whole last of the hour for a half an hour for any questions and answers. Um, you can see down below, there's the chat uh, icon down below. So if you have some questions, you can also add them in the chat and we'll get to those after the presentations. Uh, and I think without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Joel Haskard. I am the co-director of the Clean Energy Resource Teams or CERTS partnership. We work with communities across Minnesota who are interested in uh, identifying and implementing energy efficiency and renewable energy projects. And I would just say personally that my heroes are the weatherization service providers around the state because they are doing some of the great and the hard work and the good work of making some of the folks who need it the most with homes that are uh, energy efficient, they're more comfortable, they're more safe. And uh, by golly, we try to uh, help them when we can. And one of the things we're hearing loud and clear is we need more contractors, we need more workers in this field. So we thought we'd dive into that a little bit more, hopefully uh, learn a little bit more about what that work would be like, ask them a few questions. And so we've got three presenters today. I'm going to introduce all three of them, and then we're going to kick it off with Ben. So we've got Ben Golden. He's with the Department of Commerce. He's the Training and Technical Assistance Specialist with the Weather Weatherization Assistance Program. His colleague, Emily Belt, she's with Commerce and the Programs for Innovation and Equity and the Workforce Training Coordinator. And finally, we have Melissa Fine. She is the Energy and Housing Services Director at SimCAC in Southeast Minnesota. So um, I think without further ado, Ben, I might uh, send it your way. And folks should be seeing uh, the screen is being shared and we'll get it on and there, there we go. So uh, thanks everyone for, for being here today. Um, <clears throat> We so um, as Joel said, um, I'm Ben Golden, uh, training and technical assistance specialist um, with the Department of Commerce. Um, we are Department of Commerce is uh, the funding agency for the local service providers um, that do weatherization work, and we wanted to give you just um, an overview first of the weatherization assistance program and what it looks like um, in Minnesota. So um, the Weatherization Assistance Program is a federally funded program, and that those federal funds are then distributed out to the states. And the intention is to give free home energy upgrades to income eligible applicants. Um, <clears throat> these upgrades are a one-time investment in most cases. Um, there, are, there are a few cases where um, if a house has been weatherized quite a while ago, um, it could be re-weatherized, but in most cases, it's a one-time investment in the home. Um, what happens is um, that investment starts with an on-site energy audit, um, and that energy audit then recommends changes based on what, what we refer to as the savings to investment ratio. Um, that's that's a, a excess acronym just basically to say those measures need to pay for themselves um, over time. Um, so the expense that we're, we're putting into a house in most cases um, the average of that expense um, needs to uh, be modeled to pay for itself um, over the lifetime of those measures. Um, the end result, um, once those measures are complete, is an annual energy bill reduction um, for the households that we serve. Um, and um, based on some recent studies nationally, um, so this includes weatherization programs in, in all 50 states, um, for every dollar that's invested, there's about $1.72 in direct energy benefits or energy savings, and about $2.78 in non-energy benefits, which includes things like um, health benefits. If you're living in a house that doesn't have uh, mold or moisture issues, um, if you don't have to worry so much about whether your furnace is going to work, there can be a lot of additional benefits that that, that can create for a household. Um, next slide, please. So um, the U.S. Um, Department of Energy is our funder, and um, the U.S. DOE weatherization funds will fund things like the repair or replacement of a furnace um, or a hot water heater, 
um, modifications to ductwork or insulation of ductwork. Um, insulation, um, both of the building shell, so uh, walls, attic, um, and also things like pipe wrap insulation. Um, uh, also funds air sealing activities around doors, windows, bypasses into the attic, the basement, those sorts of things. Um, the replacement of lighting with more energy efficient um, uh, lighting choices. And then there are also some health and safety things um, like uh, carbon monoxide and smoke detectors um, that can also be funded through the program. This is um, what you might call the original list of weatherization services. Um, and my colleague Emily, a little bit later on, will talk about some of the newer programs that have been added um, to help get homes ready for these kinds of um, uh, these kinds of weatherization. So that could be anything from um, a roof repair that needs to be done before you can insulate an attic to keep the roof from leaking into your new insulation um, to things like electrical panel upgrades. And, and Emily will have more details on that um, coming up. So um, who does the program serve? Um, the average energy burden uh, for the, the folks that we serve is three times that of non-eligible households. Um, and if you're not um, familiar with the, the energy burden lingo there, um, that just means that um, they are on average spending three times more of their household income than the average Minnesota household um, on energy. So a bigger, uh, a bigger percentage of their income goes to paying those energy bills. Um, the program gives priority um, to a, a few groups. Um, so we said there, there has to be, there's an income threshold to qualify, but within that income threshold, um, priority is given to households with children, um, households with uh, elderly adults, disabled individuals, those with an especially high energy burden or those with especially high um, energy expenses or use. Um, about two thirds of participants live in greater Minnesota and about one third of participants live in the metro area. So um, a few things uh, um, about sort of the history of the weatherization assistance program, and we don't need to go through every bullet point here, but um, I think it, it gives you a good sense of um, the program um, was originally um, founded in some legislation that passed the U.S. Congress in the 1970s and has um, significantly expanded um, since that point. It started out with things like air sealing, window covering, weather stripping. In the 80s, things like attic and dense pack wall insulation were added. In the 90s is when we started doing really um, advanced energy audits. Um, replacing um, furnaces with high efficiency furnaces, adding some uh, continuous ventilation in bathrooms and kitchens. In the 2000s, um, we added things like lighting and uh, refrigerator emplacements, um, started working more on multifamily buildings, which is um, a particular focus of our, our program as we move into the next few years, um, working to increase the number of residents that we serve that live in multifamily buildings. Um, in the 2010s, um, we added um, things like solar um, and uh, solar H solar hot water and solar electric systems. Um, and then more recently, we have an expanded list of measures that include solar, um, but also some measures that are designed to prevent deferrals, like I mentioned before. Um, and we've moved into um, a, a focus on performance. So the, the focus on the performance of the home as a whole, um, we talk a lot about the home as a system. Um, and that that's really a focus, um, you know, sort of in in our present day. So these services are provided by 22 service providers. Um, there are 16 of those service providers that are contractor based. And um, six of those that are crew based, meaning they have um, in house crews that complete their work. Um, one important clarification, though, is that most of the crew based agencies are still using contractors in various areas. So just because they're a crew based agency doesn't mean that they wouldn't necessarily be interested in working with contractors, um, especially for things like HVAC, uh, electrical, um, some remediation activities, um, things like that. 
Um, but there are 22 service providers in the state and um, distributed, you can see on the map um, all over the state. Um, some of them uh, cover a pretty wide um, service territory as well. Um, and so that's that that'll be part of our discussion in terms of um, looking to partner with contractors. Um, you know, some agencies are looking for contractors in in really what amount to kind of different parts of the state. And then uh, here I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Emily, um, who's going to talk us through um, energy burden and um, the data and the information that we have on contractor shortages. Thanks, Ben. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Belt. I, again, am the Workforce Training Coordinator on the Programs for Innovation and Equity team, but I work really closely with the weatherization team in an effort to continue their um, programmatic efforts to expand access to their great resources and potentially um, braid and build in other programs as they're coming online. So one of the biggest concepts, I think it's just important to take a second to understand, and um, this graphic always jogs my heartstrings a little bit, and I think it's worthwhile to share, is this idea of energy burden. And our program really hinges upon this as a concept, that your energy spending divided by your household income equals your total energy burden. And as you can see, there are some real pockets across the state where that is uh, very different. Uh, I am personally seated over here in Ramsey County, where it looks like we're one of the lowest average energy burden counties in the state, as compared to areas like Cass and Aiken County, which experience up to 17 or 20 percent of their um, income being pushed and put into spending on energy to heat their homes. And if you just put that in perspective, 20 percent of your income going towards your bills is, is wild. Uh, it's a scary reality for a lot of Minnesotans, and it's something that this program has done a ton to uplift, um, as well as the energy assistance program and others that build in for our specifically low income residents in Minnesota, though there are going to be some available opportunities for um, expansion here with things like the home energy rebates program that are coming down from the Department of Energy in the next few years, highlighting the importance even more so for contractors um, feeling robust and providing services to all of the corners of our state equitably and with good access. So that's where you come in. Um, this is some data I've got in the next couple of slides reflecting some of the specific needs of the weatherization assistance program that did a needs assessment survey. This is a couple of years outdated and it is before some of the um, significant changes coming down from the federal government with the Inflation Reduction Act, funding home energy rebates and the expected expansion of some of these program offerings. So just keep that in mind that these are probably underestimated by a pretty fair margin. But one of the trends that we see is that needs across the state are very different. They don't all follow the same region and it's not all the same folks that are needed in the same spots to support these services. So. The Clean Energy Resource Team has been kind enough to help us in this process to connect our local service providers with one-on-one -on -one contractor outreach to see if perhaps you'd be willing to consider uh, expanding your offerings and working for this program. Um, specifically on this slide, you can see the shell contractor gap and asbestos contractor gap, the asbestos needs especially being really high here in the southern um, central chunk. And then again in uh, kind of the whole of central Minnesota. With shell contractors, we see a strong need here close towards um, the Anoka Ramsey corner down here, as well as the Northwest. You can take a look and visualize for yourself. But these are some of the big priority areas that we're trying to specifically support um, contractors in the weatherization program finding their way towards their local service providers. So if this speaks to you, maybe take a note and refer to the really helpful resource that Maggie just put in the chat to find your local service provider. There's a list of them all with phone numbers and contact info there. Um, for some other varieties, we've got uh, electricians and HVAC contractors are, have been a standing support of our program for a long time, but I think the needs for these program expansions continue to be um, growing as we see things like heat pump technologies or expansion of electric uh, panels in the need of those heat pumps being installed and things like that. Um, we're seeing a lot more different professionals kind of coming into the fold for each of these jobs that suddenly went from an air ceiling and 
quick ventilation check to, you know, maybe needing an electrician or a roofer or a handful of other types of contractors to come um, and intervene in the, the house repairs along the way. So as Ben mentioned, our program has seen a lot of change in the last few years. Um, and I wanted to highlight some of the specific grants and program explorations and expansions that have been happening now, as well as some of the ones we're expecting to come online so that you can kind of see the scope and scale of uh, the landscape around you. Two exciting ones are Wire and Wrap, which offered expansion of the program to reduce deferrals um, due to electrification, roofing, and window repairs. Those ones are very unique, and a lot of them are kind of in pilot stages right now to test out different technologies, such as triple pane window installations, and that's been really inspiring. Um, the Healthy Air Program is a vermiculite asbestos abatement program that's been around for at least five years now. It's been quite a while and we've got near, near whole statewide participation in that one. So that's a very excellent program to prevent people from um, having to have their house deferred due to asbestos, which in our state is just presumed to be, all, all vermiculite in the state is presumed to be asbestos carrying because of our proximity to the mine that was sourced in Montana that is now a super fun site. Um, we've also got the Community Service Pilot Project, which is evaluating um, an effort to service manufactured and mobile home parks together rather than kind of one at a time, but look at that more of a community model and how do we serve whole groups of people all at once rather than having to individually um, go through the process of consulting, talking about the work, and then moving along. So that's been a really neat progress forward. Solar into WAP, um, that is we're one of the very new and unique states really taking charge in this front. We started in 2019 and have been allowed to expand not just the weatherization services in the house itself, but to add solar as a final um, measure through the program, really reducing people's energy burden by market, market amounts. I, it's the data coming out of that has been really impressive and we're excited to see that continue growing with programs like Solar for All um, from the Inflation Reduction Act coming online here soon. Um, we also have this very new fund uh, called pre-weatherization, which was passed by our state of Minnesota legislation a year or two ago um, to help mitigate program deferrals. So for instances where a roof has a small hole and they need to do a repair job before they can go in and perhaps insulate the attic and follow down the line of weatherization approved measures, this is a special budget allowing for some of those more, um, more unique circumstances for repair to get fixed prior to our work in the weatherization world. I am very excited to see that um, coming online with service providers in this program year. But it also means that contractor needs are gonna continue expanding in a variety of different ways and we're gonna see more HVAC more electricians, as well as some of these um, roofing and other types of contractor needs. Okay, so in the, the realm of workforce development for contractors, there are a couple pretty big scale grants that we are either in the process of applying for and gaining or have already gained, one of which is the Training for Residential Energy Contractors grant that is both a formula grant and a competitive grant. The formula grant, um, we were allocated $2.8 million over the next few years. That money has not quite come in the door yet, so we're excited to see what next steps are going to be, but they're not quite rolling out yet. Um, but that's going to support specifically residential energy contractor expansion. Um, we're also pursuing a more competitive version of that grant for additional funding from the Department of Energy. If you've got information about that, we can certainly, or curiosities about that, we can certainly chat down the line. Uh, and the last that I wanted to mention, because it is due this Friday, is very exciting, is this energy auditor training grant that we are pursuing with White Earth Tribal and Community College to really um, support the energy auditor expansion needs in the northwest quadrant of the state. There are going to be a bunch of contractor needs in that region as well, but uh, we're realizing with the many programs coming online for home energy rebates, if there aren't auditors in place to be able to perform that work, we're gonna run into a lot more challenges with servicing all of the folks in Minnesota. Okay, I think I blasted through that as quick as I could, Joel. Um, so why should you join this program or why should you think about joining this program? 
we have many reasons to join this program, but I think the biggest and most heartfelt is really the idea of community impact. Um, back in program year 2020, 2022, we completed 791 Department of Energy funded jobs. That's a slice of the total fraction because we have to divvy them up based on funding a little bit. And our data for this last year is still kind of in the works for finalizing, so I don't have newer data than that. But I can tell you that the impact that this program has on individual families is huge. Um, our funding continues to rise and has gone up pretty significantly in the last couple of years with various new funding streams. So we're seeing a lot of expansion into non-traditional home energy upgrades. And I think that is a great opportunity if you're a contractor looking to expand work. You have pretty regular work, or so I hear from Melissa, or I'm very excited to hear your perspective on this in just a second, with very little need to do advertising or sales pitches or try and reach out to clients and do that work yourself because the work is in fact just coming to you. Um, and I think that's pretty novel. But this is where I'll pass it to Melissa because I think she can speak for this far better than I can at the state level to talk about your real experience with what it's like as a service provider and how that affects your community. Thanks, Melissa. All right, thanks, Emily. Um, I am Melissa Fine and I work at SEMCAC. So I'm in that bottom um, corner of the state there, Southeast. We serve eight counties um, in Southeast Minnesota here. So um, we go over as far as like Austin, Albert Lee and, um, and then Iowa and Wisconsin borders. So we serve quite a large territory. Um, right now, I am one of the um, crew-based agencies and we have two weatherization crews um, that we send out in that service territory. And it gets sometimes kind of long, you know, on the days when they have to travel um, to the far, you know, east or west of the service territory. So um, we're definitely looking for um, some other, some more contractors that can help us out with saving, you know, travel time. Um, that's a big one. Um, also just, we complete about 300 jobs um, in, a in a program year. And that does include, um, you know, like our HVAC jobs as well, which we call standalone. So sometimes we can do a weatherization job with HVAC and solar, but, and then some other jobs are just the HVAC um, jobs. So, so we are looking for um, Shell HVAC, solar and electric contractors all the time. Um, especially because like, you know, Emily said, it's such a big territory. Um, it's hard to find contractors that are gonna wanna go um, too far either. Um, and then also part of our, you know, as Emily said too, part of it, um, the program now is doing those pre-weatherization measures. Um, so vermiculite abatement, you know, roof repairs, um, we're looking for contractors to help us um, bid out on those projects as well. Um, electricians, we're doing some electrical upgrades or repairs for households. Um, so we're definitely in need of electricians too. Um, the way we assign jobs is um, for weatherization and um, HVAC, um, we do set price lists. So when you become a contractor with us, um, we get some information from you, you sign a contract with us, um, and then you complete a bid package, which lists out measures that we have available through either weatherization or HVAC, like replacing furnaces, water heaters, um, installing exhaust fans, things like that. Um, and then we ask for your price on those, on your typical install. And then when we assign you a job, um, that's what you get paid for that job then. Um, and then if prices happen to change, like we, we saw during COVID, um, we usually only update our pricing every two years, but we understand that if, you know, the economy jumps and we need to update pricing, we certainly do that. We take that into consideration. And then when a job comes up, then we would send you the work order um, that our energy auditors write up and then pay based on the job. If it's a job that's, um, you know, they need a bunch of new duct work or it's a bunch of different things other than what you bid on, um, we, have, we do allow bids on some of those larger jobs as well, because we know not every job is exactly the same. Um, paperwork, um, obviously there's going to be paperwork. Um, we can't get away from that, but it's, uh, we make it pretty simple. Really on every job, it's just, um, documenting, you know, you can, we ask for weatherization, we ask for pre, 
during and post pictures of the job, of what you're installing um, after you've installed it. Um, there's also um, the completion certificate and a signed lien waiver. Um, and then we do ask for a one-year warranty on your work um, for the client to in case something should go wrong within a year. Um, there's some diagnostic testing that does need to be done, but this can all be trained. Um, we do on-the-job training all the time. Um, when we bring on new contractors, new employees, everything, we definitely will go out and meet you on the job or work. you can work with our crews for a while um, to see how those things go. So the biggest thing you would need is access to an installation blowing machine for um, weatherization measures, and then a, um, a blower door um, would be something that you would need. Um, and then, of course, that would all be um, trained on the job, too, on how to do those testing um, requirements. Um, after the work is completed, you turn the paperwork in along with your invoice, and then we would have one of our inspectors go out, and um, it's called a QCI, a quality control inspection. And after that's completed, um, then we issue payment. I'd say it's usually within a couple weeks of the completion of completed job that you would get paid. So um, usually we're... Uh, we're definitely a guaranteed payment. Um, we, as long as the things are done correctly and they're passed by QCI, and if they don't, our QCI is really good about meeting you on the job and just talking to you about what needs to be completed or um, corrected. Um, so let's see. Um, if you're interested in this, um, definitely reach out to to one of your local service providers. Um, if you're interested in Southeast Minnesota, call me. <laughs> I'm definitely willing to um, talk to anybody about um, being willing to be a contractor. Um, it's it's not so scary. Uh, we have we have probably just over 20 um, HVAC contractors, um, which is, sounds like a lot, but you know, in an eight county service territory. Um, it gets, it's still, we could use more. So um, I guess that's kind of wraps up what I have. If um, I think now Joel was going to open it up to question and answers, maybe. Absolutely. And maybe I'll ask, uh, you're, you're watching us think about this in real time. If somebody, I don't know if it's Emily, maybe between Emily or Ben, if one of you could put your contact information in the chat, because if all else fails, and you're like, I'm not sure exactly which service territory or exactly who to call, Emily or Ben could steer you in the right direction. So we'll make sure that their contact information's in the chat. Any kind of question or follow up, hey, I'm kind of interested, who do I talk to? She can get you in the right direction. Okay, so yeah, let's open it up for uh, questions and answers. Uh, and this is the part where I say, don't be shy and uh, you know, see if you can stop them. Sorry, didn't, you guys didn't know I was gonna ask you that. <laughs> Um, yeah, any, anybody, uh, I think you just, uh, take yourself off mute. They're, they're able to take themselves off mute and, uh, fire away. Let's learn a little bit more here. Well, hearing none, I'm going to throw a couple things in, but then somebody's going to have to follow up on some of these. Um, Okay, great. So in the chat, uh, Brian has asked for uh, Melissa's contact information. You can also write, oh, and Melissa has responded. You can also write questions in the chat if you don't want to speak up. I'm just I'm just assuming that if the, these are sort of naive questions because I'm not in this game like some of, some of the contractors are that are on the call or on the Zoom today. But so people can just build in their, um, if people are driving somewhere for half an hour or 40 minutes to get to somewhere, do they just build that into their, into the contract or how are, what, how does that work? If you've got substantial drive time to get out to a job. We offer like a travel time as part of the measure. Um, so we do offer some flexibility with travel time. Um, we'd like the pricing to include up to like 60 miles or so, but if they're over 60 miles, then we can um, either build in like a set, travel um, fee or um, work that out with the contractor. It's been a little while since SEMCAC has actually worked with weatherization shell contractors. So um, at SEMCAC anyway, um, so we are 
we do have a set price list right now, but we are willing to um, look at that and adjust it because we know our prices are probably a little bit outdated, but we, you know, we're willing to work that out with the contractors. Great. I see a couple of questions here. Uh, I love this one, John. <laughs> what would be a reason not to want to be a contractor for weatherization? None. <laughs> uh. um, you know, um, you know, I, I don't, it's different work, you know? So if you are a contractor, like a rehab contractor, or you do siding, you do windows, you do, you know, building houses, you know, it's definitely not that. Um, it's, it's, that's probably the biggest thing. It's just when we hire staff, it's good to have that construction knowledge, but it is specific to the energy efficiencies, um, insulating, um, sealing up those bypasses. Um, there's great training. Um, and I know training takes time and time is money. You know, I get that, but, um, I think there's going to be some great opportunities for you guys to get some paid training. And, um, just taking, you know, the building science principles, you know, I'm not in the field a lot, but I took that class and it really helps you just kind of understand what's going on. And a lot of my um, crew workers take that, or actually two of my crew workers are energy auditors. So, you know, then they actually really understand the whole house as a system. Um, but that is all trainable. Um, so I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have that scare you. Um, How about paperwork? I know you talked about well, paperwork. I know paperwork. Yeah, nobody likes paperwork. <laughs> but um, unfortunately, that's what we do. We, you know, love paper. Um, no, it, it actually can eliminate paper. We could do it all virtually or online too, you know, emails back and forth or, you know, mm -hmm. Dropbox or whatever. We're flexible with that. If you want to be techie, we can certainly do that too. Um, but if you want to fax it in, fine. It's really just, you know, like I had said, it's the completion certificate, which we provide you, your invoice, which you would provide us, um, and then the lien waiver, um, and then your readings. So the readings are the diagnostic testing. And again, all trainable. Um, just have to have the right equipment to do those. Melissa, can I can I just jump in on the training note and just yeah. I just wanted to mention that um, if you establish a relationship with a service provider, um, many of our service providers do retention agreements, um, which um, then allows them to actually um, pay you a stipend um, for that training. Um, so um, not not all service providers do this, so it'd be something you'd want to check with your local service provider. Um, but there are opportunities. Um, for for paid training, essentially in exchange for saying yes, I'm I'm going to keep working with um, um, with this service provider for X amount of time, and that's a that's a, a bit of a negotiation with with your service provider, um, but it does mean that that um, you know you can get some of that training without that coming out of your own pocket. That's great to know. Hey, I've got another one from um, from Brian who says, "How do energy? Uh, let me see here. Give me one second here." How do energy provider rebates work with this program? And our for clarification, how I do I think it's probably that hers and homes rebates, I'm guessing, but and they may also be talking about like utility rebates. Utility rebates, rebates as well, was, maybe. Yeah, I was guessing the local utility. If we are talking about the um, expansion of inflation reduction with home energy rebate programs. The, the inner workings of how that is going to interplay and overlap with weatherization is still very much in planning and design phase. And if you're interested about participating in the way that shapes out, um, they're actively meeting with advisory groups now. So send me an email and I can get you connected with the team working on that. Um, but Melissa, I bet you've got a sense of how that works if utility rebates are playing into the field at all, huh? Um, we don't do rebates very much. Um... I guess I would say that you could probably apply for them. We don't apply for them as a service provider. We don't apply for rebates. Um, and I don't know that the household can either just because I think you have to have a paid invoice for that. I'm not positive, um, but we don't usually do the rebates because it's um, just additional paperwork, things to follow up on. And um, But again, those new rebates that are coming out, we don't know yet. 
So um, and that, that does vary to a little bit by service providers. Um, there are there are some service providers that are also um, that also do work for um, utility uh, rebate programs. Um, and so, um, you know, de depending on the service provider, um, there, there may be some service providers who are looking for contractors that might work some weatherization jobs and some utility jobs. If they're a provider that, um, that does both that that's just something you'll have to kind of work out with your, your local providers where you're located. And I see, I see, um, a couple more things. This is great. I see a couple more things in the chat, uh, Rodney, your question, I, I see Emily kind of answered some pieces of the puzzle there, like how are projects awarded? Is it lowest bid? How many bids do you get? Um, Emily, I see you did a, a nice- I wrote a very <laughs> thorough response to that one because it does vary depending on service provider. And the cheat sheet I put in the chat um, gives a really nice quick one or two pager with a lot of the Im basic info we covered in the presentation today, but also some of the more detailed nuance and links to places where you'll get the information you need to um, hear more about that contractor piece. But I did just want to clarify that there are a few different routes for that between bidding, set price lists, and um, a special stipulation for small purchases within the program that are all a little unique depending on where you're at at the state. That's great. So yeah, but those are the two just to yeah, just to tag on there, those are the two kind of categories um, for the most part, either bidded or set price. I think a lot of our service providers use um, use set pricing, um, but there are also, as Melissa was saying, there are certain projects that would be bid to if they're sort of outside the scope of those set prices. Other questions, either uh, just off mute or into the chat. I'm, I know I'm learning things as I'm kind of reading along and uh, and hearing your answers. To Jennifer's question, um, yes, service providers are largely community action agencies, but there are just a handful of our service providers in the state that are not community action based. Um, for the most part, they align pretty well, but yes. Also three, uh, two tribes, a band, and um, two, one nonprofit and one um is actually within a county government um so but yeah for the most part um community action agencies jennifer also asked how many contractors we work with i mean as i said before like we have over 20 hvac contractors but sometimes that's not even enough you know because we're still waiting we'd love to have a job completed within a couple weeks Usually an HVAC contractor can take, well, sometimes it's just days and sometimes it's weeks, just depending on their other work. So mm -hmm. that's why it's nice to have several um, contractors available. I guess it's how busy you want to be. Um, you know, if you have a lot of other work um, and you only want to do these like maybe two a month, you know, that's fine. If you want to do one a week, we can try and make that work. Um, you know, we do have our two crews, but um, as we get going here in our program year, we're going to be um, incredibly busy with jobs to get done. So, yeah. That kind of that kind of taps into John's question just a second ago. As you referenced, there was reference to growing the number served. So how much growth, you know, roughly, or give us some idea of a ballpark of like, what are we expecting here for, for growth in this particular work? I'll start that and then other folks can can add on. Um, there's there's kind of two answers to that question. There's the growth that's already happening. And a lot of that comes from the bipartisan infrastructure law that was passed in 2021. Is that right? I believe. Um, and is um, those those funds are now flowing into the state. So that part of growth um, is. Um, I think almost doubling um, the amount of uh, the amount of homes served um, compared to before that funding. Um, and then the second part of that question is the part that I think is is a little bit unknown yet. Um, and that's um, the funds that might be braided together with weatherization from the Inflation Reduction Act. Those funds have not yet come to Minnesota, so we don't know exactly what that will look like yet. But Emily might be able to not to put Emily on the spot, but might be able to talk more about that. 
It's a little tough to guess at this point because weatherization as a historical program has focused really um, importantly on low income and specifically income qualified folks. I think we're seeing a huge trend across the energy efficiency landscape of people who are middle income, high, like the whole range of people are suddenly interested, able, and accessing weatherization type services with, uh, you know, attic insulation or air sealing or the whole combined collaboration. I personally had my house done just this last year, and it's been remarkable and incredible to see how just these small changes that you can really implement in a reasonable amount of time at relatively low cost can have a huge impact on your energy savings um, month over month and your just general quality of life. So it is hard to say how much this program is going to specifically continue growing or shrinking any given year. I would say though, the trend of the industry is hugely growing. So if there is interest in learning these skills and building up and ramping up your own contractor um, basis to be able to serve the needs of Minnesotans, I see the industry continuing to move in a forward direction as people are more aware of these services, as energy bills continue to rise, and as um, the energy efficiency landscape is really, really changing from a technological perspective. Joel, did you want to add anything to that? I think that's really where CERTS has um, tapped in and done a lot of great work. Well, I know that we have something we call the ambassador program that's on the clean energy resource teams website where we are tracking all the various rebates and incentives, many of them which are coming from the Department of Commerce and then are coming into fruition from the Inflation Reduction Act. But we also try to make sure that federal, state, even some of the utility rebates are tracked along as we try to kind of think of a layer cake. So a person who is interesting in a, in a new electrical panel or a air source heat pump or uh, energy efficiency, water heater, some of these different things and technologies that have these almost a layer of, you could find federal dollars, state dollars and utility dollars potentially to, to uh, find rebates for those projects. Um, so, and as far as I, I, I remember back in the day, kind of like Obama, Obama stimulus dollars, there was the concern about, wow, people really ramped up and getting a lot of providers to get that. And then the, the dollars kind of had a steep decline. And what I've seen from some charts is that there's a level rising of dollars into this uh, from the Fed side anyway, that doesn't have a steep dive. It kind of continues on into the horizon for a number of years. So I just feel like this is an important, uh, it's an important time to, well, I'll, I'll parry now with another question. Thank you. Shailen put some information about the ambassador program in the chat there. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, like if somebody had a business, they've got a ton of work already, but they're thinking about, you know, hiring on maybe somebody part-time or I don't know if necessarily an elect I'm thinking about like apprenticeship programs through the unions or through just electricians in general like is there is this an an on-ramp that would make sense for for that kind of thing or uh you know what I mean this kind of like kind of assume you could build in some more work through weatherization service providers as sort of a um kind of a steady diet of work, I feel. <laughs> um, any thoughts on that? Because I would love some of these contractors to expand their businesses to what, you know, with their current workforce and then to see if like, well, maybe we could bring on somebody half time and see if this, if that, you know, pencils out. Uh, what do you guys think about that kind of thing? Melissa might have the best answer to that if she's if she's still on. I, I saw she went off and, and came back on, but, um, um, but I think that is, um, you know, I think that's one of the things that is attractive about working with the program is, um, the, the production of housing is happening, um, you know, pretty much year round, um, for our service providers, there are peaks and lulls like anything else, um, you know, depending on the year, um, but um, but most of our service providers have a wait list for clients 
Um, so they're they're working through um, you know clients as as quickly as they can and as they have capacity for. So that does mean that there's a, a pretty steady um, stream. And I, I know that's different. Uh, for I am here. Provider. Oh, sorry. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Did you catch that question, Melissa? Sorry, I had to, I did. Um, I don't know. I haven't really looked into the apprenticeship program yet, I guess. Uh, um, so we'd have to do some checking on that. Uh, something we need. <laughs> Melissa, we're, we're we're losing you a little bit. So uh, uh, your audio is not coming through so great. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? That sounds much better. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. The apprenticeship program, um, it's just not something we've done, but we can certainly look into the option. That's for sure. If it's going to mean getting more people, you know, in the weatherization field, we can definitely look into that. That's great. Other questions? I mean, we can wrap up a little early too if we're starting to kind of finish up here. I guess I just want to go up and say, I see that uh, earlier in the chat there was a there's a weatherization inbox, which is weatherization.commerce at state.mn.us. That's in the chat. Melissa, I see your email address. Ben, I see your email address. Emily, I see your email address. I guess I'm just thinking um, if there was any more additional questions or, hey, I'm kind of interested or I'm really interested or whatever, um, reaching out to any, any of you would work. I guess one question I just wanted to clarify is if a contractor said, hey, I'm interested, then it sounds like there's a little bit of paperwork to, to fill out on the front end. And then are they just, are they just receiving job updates through email or something that says, hey, this is available. Do you want to submit a bid? Is, is that just a flow of information that comes through the an email yes. inbox or how does it work? Okay. Yeah, we would um, definitely set up, you know, communication with them either however they want, like I said earlier, email, fax, you know, whatever you need. Um, and then, uh, yes, we just contact them when we have jobs. If they don't want jobs for a certain time, we would put that down. If they want more jobs, you know, definitely we can be flexible with that. But yeah, reach out to me and uh, we can fill, uh, look into the best way of communicating that information. And then we can also come out um, like to your business and talk more about it, go over pricing, paperwork, things like that. So we're happy to step you through the process. That's great. And if I you're was, still fortunate enough to be in Melissa's territory, feel free to use Ben and myself as resources. We'd happily help you connect with your local service provider if you're running into any concerns, questions, comments, um, thoughts about that. It's really wonderful to share the space today. Ben, at the bottom of the chat, I see again, you, you uh, shared the link so people can find their local service providers. Yep, and that's uh, a that's a list by county. Um, so if you're um, if you're a contractor that works in multiple counties, um, it's worth you know checking all the way through the list because there might be multiple service providers that are in that are in the territory that that you work in. Great. Final questions, comments. I'm gonna let folks uh, leave a bit early here. Right on. Well, I really want to thank our presenters. Uh, thanks for our two folks from the Department of Commerce. Thank you, Melissa from SEMCAC, uh, Ben and Emily at Commerce. This has been, for me, it's been really, uh, I learned a few things. Contractors who are on the, the webinar, I hope you may consider this as an additional job resource, funding resource. Uh, give these folks a try and see what you think because uh, the jobs are sitting there waiting for you. <laughs> we just need you. <laughs> All right. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks again.